In this video, we are going to be talking about the pre-code horror film, The Black Cat, which was released in 1934, and it starred Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. My guest today, I want to welcome back Vanessa Butino, who has been on my podcast many times. Vanessa, thanks again for joining me on, on another pre-code conversation. <laughs> no problem. It, it's yeah. like these have started becoming routine for us, and yeah. I'm enjoying them. <laughs> no, me too, because um, they offer so much. And again, I don't, when I think pre-code, I've been thinking about a, like, you know, the movies we've been discussing, you know, Barbara Stanwyck, Gene Harlow. Uh, those kind of actors but this period was like there was a horror craze you know with Dracula Frankenstein uh throughout the pre-code era pre and all I think often by Universal Pictures uh mm -hmm. this is Universal Pictures as well just before we jump into it because I know uh from talking last year on our Halloween we did a Halloween talk and I know you like a lot of the classic horror films you know pre-code horror films what is it about the classic horror that has always attracted you? I think first and foremost, the style. Yeah. Uh, the style of classic horror films, particularly the ones from the pre-code era, there's just that creepy art deco style to them that mm -hmm. no other horror film of any other era seems to match or be able to match. So yeah, it's, it's the style for me. It, it, and not even just the visual style, the style of storytelling I quite like as well, where some aspects of the story are kept a mystery or they're kept hidden from the viewer on purpose. Yeah. And that's what makes them even creepier because you're always left wondering, well, like what just happened or what did I just watch or, oh my God, what's going to happen next? Yeah. Yeah. This film has those elements as well. And you wouldn't happen to know, was it mainly Universal who were making horror films during in the pre-code era or were they just the most successful at it? I no, They weren't the only ones. OK. I think each major and minor studio at the time was dabbling in horror. Yeah. But Universal uh, Studios is the one that cashed in the most. Right. And and they and their films proved to be the most popular. And it all started with Frankenstein and Dracula in right. the early 1930s. And then it just carried on from there. And this one, The Black Cat, was released, I believe, in May 1934. Yeah. And it was Universal Pictures' biggest film of the whole year. So horror yeah. in that time was huge, huge, a big moneymaker. And yeah, each no, studio I was reading that. Yeah, and each studio dabbled in horror, not just Universal. I think when we were talking during the week, you had mentioned this was like the, the code became much more enforced just after, like two months after this was released. Yes. Wow. So, OK, so if this film was released in May of 1934, right. the, the Hollywood production code, it, it had always existed from the time that silent films transferred over to talkies. So there was a production code in effect since talkies became yeah. a thing in the late 1920s. It's just that the production code wasn't heavily enforced until July 1934. Right. So you have this film, The Black Cat, that came out two or three months prior to the code being strictly enforced. Can you imagine what would have happened to this film if it had come out after July oh, yeah. 1934. I don't, I don't even think they could have released it. <laughs> well, you know what? If it, you know, it, it probably would have been canned. So they probably just wouldn't have released it because how do you release this film uh, under strict enforcement of the code? There's yeah. so much in this film that's like, whoa, no, you oh, can't show God, that yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Or otherwise they would have released it because they would have still wanted to see if they could make money uh, right. from it, but they would have heavily censored it. And I think if that had happened, they would have risked losing a lot of the plot. Right. And I don't think the film would have made very much sense if it had been heavily censored under yeah, the code. And, and not only that, I mean, it's an, only an hour and five minutes. So yeah. it would have, it would have <laughs> been one of those like short films that they basically do a lot of short films back then as well. Um, no, that's interesting. Two months before. 
Uh, so just looking at it, um, I know you rewatched it. I know you've seen it in the past. Uh, what are your feelings this time around watching it again? I, I just, it came to mind again, just how much I love this film. I love particularly the art direction. Like I said before, just the visual style, the design of the sets, everything, the props. Oh my God, it's just perfection. Yeah. And I, I realized, I've seen this film many times before, but I think this time I realized how nice it was to have Bela Lugosi play the, I, I don't want to say hero, but he played the good guy in this yeah. film. And that's, that's very odd that that did not happen frequently in his career. Unfortunately, he was so good at playing villains. Right. But is it, isn't it strange to see him in the good guy role? Yeah. I, I really like that about it because when you first see him on the train and he has to share the, the compartment with that young couple, I mean, he's, he's, I don't think, I don't think he could, I, I think even, even if he tried as hard as not to be creepy, <laughs> he yes, couldn't I do agree. It. He's always creepy, which made the character uh, interesting because you never really knew. It, it made him less predictable because he doesn't seem uh, clean cut. And of course, you, you know, you can't help but think of Dracula as soon as you see him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and it, what also is interesting is that the, the characters, the young couple, they never trust him either at the you know at the house there's that scene when he comes in to after the, the the young woman passes out when her husband got hit by the servant and she immediately you know thinks that that he was in on it or he's doing something and he was trying to tell her no 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 I'm trying to get you out mm -hmm. uh and then even in the end right I mean he gets he gets killed just because the husband thought he was harming the woman and the irony is he was like he's like the anti-hero of the story <laughs> Well, yes. not even right he's just they think he's he's you know um uh, up to no good and the, the reality is he's he's just out for revenge against karloff yeah very <laughs> true and it, it's so fun because i think at, seeing this film for the first time i can't echo this because i've seen this film many times before but if you're watching this film for the first time it's almost as if you're watching things through the eyes of that young couple yeah, and, yeah. and you are never really sure what that guy's motives are. Is he a good guy or is he the villain? Right. And you right. don't find out really a hundred percent until the very end when he tries to help the mm -hmm. young woman get out. Yeah. yeah. Just awesome storytelling. Awesome. Yeah, no, I agree. And you know, this, there's a lot of themes in this film, but I mean, what do you think, it's it's about uh in its in its essence i mean what do you take from it oh goodness that's a hard question with this film i th i think it's i think it's about revenge more than anything else and i i think there's just a level of desperation in it what would you do okay because okay essentially Bela Lugosi's character and Bor uh, Boris Karloff's character fought together in the First World War. Right. And Karloff, from what I, I've read about the plot, Karloff was the, the commander of yes. Lugosi's unit. So they all fought together and Karloff was the commander. And l at the end of the war, Lugosi is sent to a prison camp for 15 years. And during that time, Karloff takes Lugosi's wife and daughter and essentially just marries the wife. And then once that wife dies, he marries the daughter. So it's, yeah. it's kind of creepy. But anyway, the whole thing is that Lugosi, when he gets out of this prison camp after 15 years, all he really wants is his wife and daughter back. So there's that sense of desperation yeah. just to get his life back. Yeah. And when he finds out that Karloff, his commander that he fought through the war with, essentially murdered his wife and then married his daughter. Can you imagine? Yeah. So, yeah, th this film is about revenge more yeah. than anything, because this this man's family was taken away from him. 
Yeah, I think that's a big part of the film. I, I was also really attracted to this theme of like spiritual death. Like they're, they're both like walking zombies in a way, more so, more, more so Karloff. Uh, and because here he is, he's, he has built this mansion. He lives on top of the ruins of basically dead bodies. That was really his uh, fault for selling out the people that he was uh, in command of to the Russians, which is what yeah. uh, Lugosi accuses him of. And the, it, it's so interesting that he is now living basically on top of these graves. And what I liked is that they don't necessarily tell you why he's doing that. And apparently this film got people interested in psychiatry. And I think uh, it is more psychological because I think it, it's rooted, I mean, as, as obviously he's the villain in the story, but there are elements of him that show his humanity because I think, and he makes note that there's no difference between him and Lugosi and, and the people who died because they are dead too. And I think ultimately he is dead inside. He's still living, mm -hmm. but um, his, his, he, he died on that battlefield with those people. And so therefore he's living amongst them and he's preserving all of those, you know, bodies, the, all the women, you know, I mean, I don't know if that's, if, you know, it's obviously he's like a necrophiliac attracted to dead corpses. And it's and just those, those images of all those, those women in those, you know, glass cases. I, I don't know. I don't know why he was like that because they don't necessarily connect that with um, his experiences at the war, but obviously this guy has a real evil spirit. Uh, he's a, you know, he's a, he's practicing uh, Satanism and he's holding like black masses and like church of Satan masses uh, towards the end. And uh, he's obsessed with the dead. I mean, did that, did that happen as a result of the war? Like did his mm -hmm. obsession begin from surrounding himself with more and more death by living amongst the dead? I don't know. I don't know what you felt. About how I you think, felt about that. yeah, I, I think you hit the nail right on the head there. I think he's, he's both fascinated and disturbed by death. And yeah, I think by yeah. building his home up on that hill, on top of all those dead and buried bodies, mm -hmm. I think it's almost as if he's exerting or illustrating how much power he physically has over the dead, over right. life and death, how he's the one in control. And I think that's also why he turned to Satanism and cult worshiping. But the interesting thing is, and I was reading up on this last night, is did you notice that, okay, he's reading that book in bed one night about the satanic rites yeah, of Lucifer. Lucifer chapter, yeah. But then when he actually holds the ritual in his underground basement there, where all his dead wives are like essentially on display in those glass tanks, he's the one being worshipped by his cult yes. members. It's yeah. not it's not that he's worshipping Satan. He himself is being worshipped. Right. So I, I think, yes, he in this film, he truly believes that he has power over life and death. Mm. Yeah, I wonder if that has something to do. Um, yeah, I, actually, I didn't, I didn't notice that. But it's like, you know, I mean, people who are religious believe that God created, you know, humanity. So maybe he feels that he creates death, you know, mm -hmm. like he is the, the living embodiment of the devil or something. I mean, I don't know. Well, yeah. Why, yeah. why else would he have all those women, those dead yeah, bodies yeah, on display yeah. in, in glass tanks? Because he wants everyone to see that he holds power over these uh, women yeah, and he's the one who can give them life or take it away. He's well, the one. Yeah. 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 Which is so like, that is so twisted and dark. I mean, <laughs> I think even today, I mean, and we've seen so many things in, in horror films in terms of gore and blood, but I mean, I don't think it gets much to, like that is like truly like the darkest places in someone's humanity uh, that one can go. What's what I find, I mean, to me, he's the more interesting of the two characters because I mean, I think Lugosi is pretty clear what he wants and why. Mm -hmm. And I think with Karloff, it's much more ambiguous, which is leading to these kind of kind of conversations. And another thing I was wondering about is that, you know, he 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 kills uh Bela Lugosi's wife 
and essentially you know married that same woman and his and then basically married his stepdaughter and why keep her alive you know i couldn't understand why he felt maybe that was some kind of a soft spot in him i don't know if you what you thought i don't i don't think it was a soft spot at all i think he got off on the fact that he had the wife and now he's got the daughter yeah like yeah, sexually speaking sick. i mean yeah, yeah. I, I think it was just a sick fascination for him i don't think he had any love at all for those two women or any of his previous wives that he killed right. i think it was ju a, just a sick fascination yeah yeah i think i think you're right i mean of course then then he turns towards the 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 wife uh, the, the young couple and that's basically going to be his next, you know, victim, so to mm -hmm. speak. Uh, and it was so creepy just the way he was looking at her. Like he's about to leave and he turns and just gives her this like sadistic smile. <laughs> and then she just like, you know, covers like not that she was undressed much, but I guess they just made the point that she very much notices the way he's looking at her. Mm -hmm. um, what did you think the black cat represented? You know, you see that Magosi was terrified. Of and he says that they represent evil. I mean, was it was there something more to it than simply that? I don't know what you thought. That's something that I never truly understood about this film, and and it's not for lack of trying to learn more about it because I I've researched it online and in books, and I I don't know. I mean, is it just a basic? fright that he has uh, because there's lots of people who are afraid of cats or snakes or spiders whatever but yeah. it's just it's highlighted so much in this film that he's and it's got the title. so it, you, you yeah know, well I, I know that it, it, they it's, well it's as you know i'm sure that people they, they even put in the title card that it was based on the edgar Allan poe story but this this has not from what i haven't read that story but from what i read about the the synopsis this has nothing to do with that other no. than the title of the other than the title of the book. So um, perhaps they were just trying to, you know, market it towards making people think it was about this really scary story. Uh, I but mean, I, 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 I mean, it's possible that uh, because of the result of the war, they both came out with these like strong phobias. And in his case, um, you know, Karloff's character becomes like the worst human being imaginable and Lugosi just goes into complete fear uh you know again and he's been afraid all these years in a prison camp fear of what happened to his wife fear of what happened to his daughter so maybe that's the representation there i don't know I don't it's possible it's you know, possible I yeah I, I read the same thing about the the poe story where it's basically just the title that was taken for this film. The the right. story itself has bears very little resemblance to Poe's story. However, now that I'm thinking about it, perhaps it, it was just used an, as an element in this film of humanizing Lugosi's character, maybe by instilling some kind of irrational fear on this character, the audience sees that he's human, like he has feelings and he has emotions and yeah we all have these irrational fears yeah, of yeah. something whether it be like i said before spiders or heights maybe it was just their way of making him seem human or i mean back then yeah. black cats were thought of as something that would bring bad luck so right. maybe that has something to do. I don't know. You know what? Whoever's watching or listening to this, <laughs> yeah. like tell us what you guys. Yeah. yeah. Because I mean, it could be anything. Yeah. It's, it's a good question. I mean, it, 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 it may have just been, I mean, I don't, I don't think they, they just added it for some kind of, you know, um, frights, if, you know, fearful moments i mean because it i mean the, like it, it's quite a striking shot when the cat appears and look yeah. gets scared and then you know kill throws a knife at him uh, mm -hmm. at the cat and you know then he has another one right again it's the nine lines i don't know maybe it has something to do with with um uh maybe i mean unless it has something to do with the fact that they died and you know that they they've lived again just like uh, just like the cats have nine lives, they die and they come back. I, I don't know, maybe we're reading too much into it. But, <laughs> it could um, be. <laughs> it certainly left me, left me wondering, what is this uh, meant to, to represent? Did you, did you feel that this had a tongue-in-cheek feel to it? 
Yes and no. Yeah, that's I think what I thought. There, there were some. Okay, if if you're familiar with early universal horror, I could tell there were some instances in the Black Cat that seemed to pay homage or tribute to the earlier universal horror films. Uh, a lot of the shots, when Karloff is first introduced in The Black Cat, there's those quick cutaway shots to his face. And the same thing was done when he was introduced as Frankenstein's monster in 1931's Frankenstein. So the first time you see the monster, there is these jarring, uh, quick camera takes of the monster's right. face. And it was almost kind of echoed in this film. Right. So I think in that way, it is very tongue in cheek because it's like they're paying homage to the earlier horror films that kicked off this horror craze in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and they're putting like, the two of them together as well. Yeah, time, kind of right? connecting them, connecting yeah. them in the audience's mind. So I think if you're a universal horror fan and you've played, you've paid close attention to the earlier films, you'll see some similar shots and camera angles or even similar looks from the actors because these actors have all worked together before. Aside right. from uh, Karloff and Lugosi, who, which this was their first on-screen pairing. But right. David Manners, who's Canadian, yay. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, David Manners, who was in this film as one half of the young couple. Oh, yeah, he, yeah. He worked with Lugosi in Dracula. He played Jonathan Harker opposite Lugosi's count. Oh, yes, yes. So you had, and I'm sure a lot of the crew must have been the same too, right. because, with you know, Dracula, Frankenstein, and this film came out just a handful of years apart. So it must have been the same crew working yeah. on these two films. So, yeah, I think it was tongue-in-cheek in that way and that you see very um, common similarities between all these different horror films. And I thought that was pretty cool. I, I thought that 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 ending in particular was it was very it was very Hitchcockian since it was rooted in, in irony because you know David uh, Peter Allison played by David Manners you know he was a writer a mystery writer mm -hmm. and of course yes. he wrote this whole story this whole experience into a book and then they're reading that review at the end that says oh my God this this guy's story he's, he's so melodramatic and he's his imagination he went wild it's un, it's totally not believable and of course the irony is that it really happened and yes. that reminded me so much of of um uh, of what hitchcock would have done like in dial m for murder one of the characters was a writer and as a, as a way to to get grace kelly out of jail he went to the husband uh, to, to come up with this big fiction story that they can bring uh, to the to the police to get her out. And the irony is, is that story that he came up with was absolutely true. Yes. Uh, and it's so tongue in cheek in that sense. And he also had the uh, the police officers, uh, you know, arguing about where was the better place to travel among. In yes. And that that was like a, a moment of relief, you know, the yeah. comic relief. Uh, but exactly. I thought that ending was so Hitchcockian. You know, I don't know if that was something that popped out to you. At yes, all. it did. I'm glad you mentioned it. Maybe that's where Hitchcock got it from. You never it know. Could be. I mean, it could <laughs> be because, well, I mean, you know, Dial M for Murder was, was based on a play. So maybe the writer of that play uh, yeah. was looking at these classic horror films. Uh, but I mean, certainly, you know, Hitchcock was always interested in irony and and, and sense of surrealism and tongue in, and make, finding humor in the, the most scariest of places. Um, I mean, it would be interesting to see how he would have done this film. I mean, I think, um, I think it would have been, I think it would have been very, very similar, but different in some ways. I mean, this is directed by Edgar G. Ulmer. Mm -hmm. And I read a bit of trivia that he married, was it the wife, Joan Allison? I don't know if you read that, who played... I I don't think he married her. Was I think it, it was Lund, maybe. it was it was someone else, one of the other actresses in the film. Yeah, I think it was the actress who played uh, Bella Lugosi's wife and daughter because that that actress plays both roles. 
That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I didn't notice I, that until the end that I, I, I put it together, that it was the same. Yeah. It was um, the same actress. And oddly enough, the characters are both called Karen. And I remember yes. being so confused yeah. about that the first time <laughs> I watched the movie. I'm like, well, which Karen are they talking about? But both the wife and daughter are named Karen. Yeah. Which is so strange. Yeah. Which, which then again uh, is common. I mean, people often will name their son or daughter. True. Maybe it's a little more common with men. Uh, you know, John and here's John Jr. <laughs> True, <laughs> yeah. Yes stuff like that but um i could see how the uh, that would have thrown the audience because we're not used to that mm -hmm. in storytelling as much uh but yeah and apparently this sort of ruined his career because that woman was the was already married and she was also the the niece of someone very oh, high up. yeah and, uh, yeah and that sort of um because he came in between that marriage uh, yes. that, that pit, that really, that really ruined his career for a number of years. So I thought that was interesting. Well, um, Almer, the director of this film, he was mostly known for making B pictures. Right. I, th I think the black cat, and then he, he went on to do detour, which is a very popular oh, did he film. Do detour? Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that was a very popular film noir that came out in the forties, I yeah, believe. 44, I think. Yeah. So the black cat and detour are his most well-known films. The rest of them are, I think the majority of them are B films, which I mean, look, there's nothing wrong with B films, though. Those are very entertaining films. It's just yeah. they didn't have the budget of an right. A picture. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm just looking at it here. So it was Shirley Castle was. OK, the, so that uh, wasn't that wasn't the actress that played the uh, so, so the that wife was and the daughter. Young, that was the, the 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 wife, the young couple, I believe. Uh, or, or do I have that wrong? No, I don't think it was. I think the the one who played the newlywed wife, her name was. Oh yeah, no, you're right. So that was Joan Allison. Yes. Uh, oh yeah. So this this must Julie have been Bishop. A... Julie Bishop is her real name, and the character name is Joan Allison. That's the newlywed wife. Right. So this this must have been a smaller part. Could have been an extra. Yeah. It could have been one of the cult members or one of the women in oh, the tank in those tanks. Yeah. And then there was something else that I was reading that he apparently wanted to date one of the women who were in the tanks there. And she said no. And as payback, he left her in there. Yes, I read that oh too. Oh my God. I read I mean, that too. Jesus Christ. Talk and you know what? Talk about <laughs> fragile ego and deep insecurity. <laughs> so <laughs> all this, it hurts to get rejected. But <laughs> all this Hollywood Me Too movement. Yeah. I mean, this was happening in 1934, people. <laughs> well, you know, I can't help but think of that. You know, when you hear yeah. these, these stories, uh, I can't help but think of that either. Is there is there something... Uh, you know, I know that you, you love the the style as you you were talking about the style and the set set. Um, is do you think do you love that because you feel that it adds to the emotion of the piece, or do you think you uh, you you just you you love it because of uh, the aesthetic or, or a combination of two? Yeah, both. It's a combination of both. I think, for instance, the inside of Karloff's mansion everything like art deco everything is very fluid and there's a lot of arches and everything it just there's no sharp edges so the, for instance the staircase the main staircase that you see in the front hall it's very fluid and circular right, right. and i think that it is not just aesthetically pleasing but it also kind of mimics the emotions that the audience is going through while watching this film, because you start like way up at the top and then just throughout the film, you just start to slide and slide yeah, as this thing, point. as this story gets more and more demented and there's all these right. twists and turns. I, I think it beautifully mimics the storytelling. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, the art direction. And I want to point him out. Uh, the art director on this film is Charles D. Hall. He did a fantastic job yeah, on I the agree. settings. And not just the inside of Karloff's house, the outside as well. When you see those brief shots 
at the very beginning when the travelers are approaching this home from the outside you see the crosses all stuck in the ground at, yeah. at odd angles to yeah. represent all the bodies buried beneath and right. it's just oh it's just beautiful the way yeah. that this film was designed and captured in terms of cinematography it's just beautiful no, I completely agree. And I, I'm curious if there were any uh, any shots that really popped out to you here that are really memorable for you. Those those shots of Karloff's character when we first meet him, those brief, <laughs> like, yeah, jarring shots. Oh, yeah. I love it. Uh, and because it mimics his character in 1931's Frankenstein. So it's much, just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I could spot it right away. I'm like, oh my God, they're paying tribute to Frankenstein there. Right. It's fantastic. I, you know, that was a really, yeah, even the way in which he got up, you mm -hmm. know, it was very Frankenstein. He just sits right up and he's in silhouette. Yes. And, um, you know, with this like beautiful woman lying next to him and you just think, who is this guy? I mean, everything gives you the feeling that something is not right. I mean, there's something not right about, about Lugosi. There's something certainly not right about Karloff and they chip away at it. Well, you know what? There was one thing that I it popped out to me uh, with Lugosi when he's on the train. He, mm -hmm. he uh, looks out the window for a second and the camera pans to the re reflection. And as he looks out, you see smoke. And it was almost as if he was going into hell. I, I, I took it that way anyway. I don't know if that, maybe I'm reaching for something. I don't know if that popped <laughs> out to you. But because he actually drew attention to it, he actually said, oh, do you mind if I open the shade? Mm -hmm. I thought there must have been a reason, you know, that they did that. It reminded me of Shadow of a Doubt when uh, Joseph Cotton and, and Hitchcock said he did this intentionally. As soon mm -hmm. as he gets into this small town, he intentionally had bl the black smoke be so dominant from the train as if, you know, the devil, the, the devil's coming or something along those lines. I don't know if that was something that yeah. <laughs> maybe it was so subtle that, that, uh, um, you know, they, yeah, maybe, maybe you got to look for it, but it's very, very brief. I don't know yeah. if, that, if you noticed it. I did notice it. <laughs> and part of me wants, okay, well, it was obviously done to establish some kind of atmosphere and mood. When you right. see this billowy smoke, you're, uh, you automatically uh, like shiver almost. Cause you know, that's, that can't mean good. <laughs> you know, something is coming, but oh, yeah. also yeah. to me as a mega fan of 1931's Dracula, when you see the count coming out of his coffin for the first time, there's that billowy smoke along the floor of the basement as him yes, and his yeah. three wives come out of the caskets. So for me, again, that was a tribute to a yeah, film that be. came a few years earlier. And yeah. yeah, the studio intentionally did that. I like to think that's the case. I don't know if I'm <laughs> right. But well, it yeah. Could be, yeah, it certainly could be part homage and part, you know, to, to add to the, uh, to the emotion of the, of the stories. Yeah. Um, it was probably an atmospheric thing, but yeah. we're, we're reading too much into it. <laughs> <laughs> one one shot that really popped out to me was was when he begins to skin Karloff towards oh, the end. And, uh, and nice. I, I again, I mean, talk about you know these pre code films. I mean, a character skinning a man alive, uh, and just you see the silhouette and. Of course, it's scarier because you're thinking I'm seeing the images of like skin coming off of him, but you don't see a thing. It's all, but no. you see him with the knife and the silhouette. Um, I thought that was shot, you know, so, so um, beautifully. And yes. this, this aspect of like uh, a game, you know, like Karloff is, says that he wants to keep the woman there, the young woman. And of course, Lugosi knows what he's up to. So they play a game of chess over, over mm -hmm. it. And even at the end, Lugosi refers to uh, right before he's about to, you know, there's dynamite under this whole yeah. house and right before he's about to blow everyone up, himself included. Uh, then again, he's been shot. So I think he knew he was going to die. Um, he says, it's, it's been nice playing with you, you know? So there's, what is this element of like life and death being a game? I don't, I don't know what, well, that's, that, what you thought about that. That's the thing that I was referring to before where Karloff's character seems to think that he has this power over life and death. He, uh, tru right. he truly believes that of himself. So when Lugosi and him sit down to play that game of chess, 
and whoever wins. So if Karloff wins the game of chess, the newlywed couple will die. If Lugosi right. wins, then the newlywed couple will survive and be right. able to leave the house. And Karloff knows even before the two of them sit down to play, he knows he's going to win. And he says oh, that yeah, to Lugosi, yeah. <laughs> you can't win against me. Yeah. So he, he wins so fast. <laughs> that's right. So he knows, he truly believes that he himself has this power over life and death. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good, that's a, that's a, yeah, you nailed it there for sure. It, it reminded me of, I don't know. I don't know if you've ever seen Igmar Bergman's *The Seventh Seal*, but that famous uh, shot of Death playing the chess game with Max von Sydow, because Death is there to kill, to take Max von Sydow, and they play they play a game of chess over it. And I, I was like, I wonder if Bergman <laughs> got that from this because he was a huge Dracula fan. It's um, possible, yeah. So it's just so interesting how people can see something in a movie and use it in their own way, you know, 20, 30, 90 years later. Is there anything else you wanted to say about this film? There was one quick tidbit I'd like to point out, and this is for like all the tech nerds out there, because I myself <laughs> am a tech nerd. I was reading online that this film, so you see, okay, Karloff's house where all these characters are staying is very advanced because his He's an architect. He makes a living now after the war as an right. architect. And right. he's renowned throughout Europe as being like one of the, the greats. So you see in his house, everything is like top of the line, very stylish. And you see next to David Manners, the guy who plays the young uh, husband in his room, there's a nightstand by his bed and it's got a digital clock on it. And I remember when I watched the movie, uh, a, a few days ago, I, I never paid attention to it before, but I'm like, oh my God, there's a digital clock. When was, when was the last time I saw that in a pre-code? Oh, yeah, Usually right. it's a clock with, with yeah. hands. That's so true. That, I, I was reading. I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> you know, but I forget that this is 90 years ago. Yeah. And then I, I read online afterwards that this was one of the very first depictions of a digital clock in film. Isn't that cool? Oh like I just, yeah. I think that's so cool. Yeah, no, I didn't yeah. know. I did not know that. And, you know, again, you know, when you're looking at it in 2021, because those clocks are everywhere, everywhere. and you, yeah. you forget, oh my God, that that's like, you know, yeah, but that, was, that was top of the line back then. Can you imagine <laughs> it being in the audience in 1934 and seeing yeah. that? Oh yeah. man, that's just see little things like that. I love, I yeah. love it. That would have, that would have been mind blowing at the time for sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, that's, it's, it's, it's a really unique, it's a really, really unique film. And I, I honestly didn't think I would care for it that much. Mm -hmm. I just thought, oh, you know, I don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not the biggest horror fan. And, uh, but there are some horrors that I just really latch onto. And I thought that this was great. And just to see Karloff and Lugosi together yeah. was just a real yeah. treat. And apparently they got along quite yes. well. <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of people seem to love spreading the rumor that Karloff and Lugosi did not get along, but that's, that's not the case. It's the yeah. same with Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. Everyone believes, oh, they used to fight. Okay. They weren't the best of friends, but they worked <laughs> extremely well together. Yeah. Otherwise, well, professional. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise Karloff and Lugosi would not have went on to make seven more films together. Right. I mean, if you absolutely hated the person, why would you go on to make more films with them? Yeah. But I, yes, they had a wonderful working relationship. And I know that prior to starting this film, uh, Lugosi did have concerns where he thought that Karloff would steal scenes from him. Yeah, I read that. Yeah, and, and I guess Karloff somehow found out. So he sat down with Lugosi and he said, listen, that, that's not my motive here. We're both here to do a job and we're both here to do it well. So let's let's do this together. And they're... Like I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it because you have these two masters of cinema together on screen. And I think putting them together is just absolute yeah. magic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. It really reminds me of when you saw so many iconic actors being paired for the first time, you know, like, as you said, Joan Crawford, Betty Davis or Robert De Niro and Al Pacino and yeah. Heat. And, um, you know, sometimes sometimes it works uh, beautifully and sometimes it doesn't but this is certainly one of those occasions when uh yes. it did yeah. uh well vanessa thanks again it's always a treat to have you on talk about 
three quarter any movies really. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's always awesome. I, we always have a good time. Yeah, no, absolutely. So thanks again for joining me. And for those of you uh, listening to this and the audio version of the podcast, which you can find anywhere, uh, there is, there's only so many episodes on my YouTube channel on the audio version. So if you're on the go listening to this, head over to the YouTube channel and there's a, a lot more there. And if you're watching it on YouTube and you want to listen to this on the go, then go to the audio version because there's plenty of episodes there for you to listen to. And I also have a Patreon membership. If you want to become a member, just go to patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. I'll leave the link in the description box below. I actually have a pre-code tier uh, where you can find all sorts of, you know, bonus content uh, if you're interested in becoming a member. And if this is your first time on my channel, please consider subscribing. It's absolutely free to do so. You just have to click the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo. You'll see it right here floating above my head to your top left. Just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release a new video. Well, Vanessa, thanks again. And we will see everyone soon.